All right, everyone. Good morning. Let's get started with this week. Um, so last week we wrapped up the intro to R. Um, I hope that was useful for you to, like if you were not familiar with R yet, I hope that was useful for you to um, better understand how R works, what we need to understand about the language, the syntax, how to get help and so on. Uh, really my goal with that is even though throughout this course, we're gonna be developing codes on our own in class here, but I also wish that uh, you get a good enough foundation that you can really go ahead and learn things on your own, You even beyond the scope of this class. Um, and I think having an intro to our helps understanding where things come, where they go, and how to look for help. All right, so today I have uh, the, the class today is going to be split in two parts. The first one is going to be a lecture that I want to give you. I'm going to talk about um, reproducible science. Uh, maybe you've seen these slides already last week if you were attending the seminar uh, for the data science certificate. Um, but I guess most of you were not in that class. So um, I want to share these thoughts with you and really set the stage for one of the goals of this class, again, is to introduce you to some statistical concepts some machine learning concepts, but also to some data science concepts all together. Um, and part of that, I think a really interesting overlapping area of all those topics is reproducible science and how we can use data science tools to make sure our science, our actual science is reproducible. So we're going to go through that first, uh, and then we're going to get into our data wrangling exercise. Before all that, I just want to make uh, a point here that I added to our, to our um, page here on the right, on the very top of the page for this class, I added the two important links that you're going to be using a lot throughout this course, which is the GitHub repository for this specific class and also the YouTube channel. On the YouTube channel um, is where I post videos for, from both this class, but also from my other class I'm also teaching. So whenever you use those resources, make sure you're watching the right the right um, videos. I do add on the title the, the date and also the the name of the class so you can orient yourself. And also, um, so the YouTube channel is where the video will, will post immediately. So at, right after I get off class, I go to my office and upload the video to YouTube. And I only later update the link here. So if you want the latest, uh, the latest version of whatever, or the most up-to-date source for the video, at least, would be go straight to my YouTube channel, look for it there. And uh, later in the day, I'll, I'll then uh, upload the website to include the link on the schedule here. Also, um, I added um, a new part of the website here that's called Reading. So here I'm going to post either PDFs, uh, papers, or maybe resources that I think are interesting for you to be aware of. Um, and really, I want to give you at least a week notice from the class when we have a new reading. Um, I think that when I posted the reading for today, it was maybe not a full week um, ago, but I gave you some time there. And really, to, to tell you the truth, um, every time we have a reading there, it is fair game for me to ask in-class quiz questions related to that. It's not going to be anything difficult. You're not going to have to deep, you know, like reopen again the reading during the quiz. That's not the goal. The goal is just to see if you got the overall idea of that. Um, and we're, I plan to have multiple quizzes as well. So even if you miss a reading or maybe, um, you know, you, you're not able to read it before class, you can always make up for it in the, in the future ones. Um, the first reading that I added here was from, for that welcome and intro. This is a paper related to data science curriculum. Uh, called 50 Years of Data Science, I think is really interesting because it sets the stage for what has been done in the past and uh, what they recommend as being part of a data science curriculum. We're not going to have a quiz about this since it's already passed. Um, you know, the class happened first before I, I posted this reading. Nonetheless, I think it's a very interesting reading if you're, you know, under, trying to understand better the data science um, as, as a discipline and how that's evolving and how this course specifically fits within that and what you're learning, how that fits into this curriculum. All right, so uh, I'm here on our, our class page. 
Um, I want to come here on today's class and launch this presentation. As you know, my presentations are always going to be posted here. Most of them are going to be in HTML um, format like this one. So you always can go back to it. There are hyperlinks. You can click on it and so on. Uh, if you do want to download it, I had instructions. If you do want to download this as a PDF, I had instructions for how to do this uh, on, on our welcome lecture. Uh, you can always go back to that to, if you need a refresh, but just very quickly here, um, if you push the, the, the letter E on your keyboard, this basically transforms this into a PDF or a continuous scrolling file. It doesn't look all, you know, all, I guess as great as it does in HTML and some slides, but anyways, and then you can just download this as a PDF by going to file, save as, or export as PDF, or I'm not sure how that would look like on a Windows uh, PC, but um, that's that's the idea. If you want to download, take notes. If you just want to follow along and maybe take notes elsewhere, uh, you're welcome to do that as well. Okay. <laughs> So uh, this you know, first part here where we had the lecture, this presentation is called From Zero to Hero, a researcher's path through data science tools for reproducibility. This is basically my personal path, starting on my master's, going through my PhD, my postdoc, and now as a professor, what were the tools that I learned at different times uh, during that path that I think, at least to me, made a lot of difference. And I know many colleagues that also benefited hugely from some of these, these tools. So I just want to share that with you. If you have not, if you have already heard about them, great. You're already doing uh, very good on making sure your science is reproducible. If you have not heard about them, I want to today expose you to those, and then we're going to be using some of these throughout this class. So what is reproducibility? So we mean by reprodu reproducibility, we mean that research is reproducible when others can reproduce the results of a scientific study given only the original data, code, and documentation. So let's say um, your study would be reproducible if I ask you, hey, can you send me your code and your data uh, and your documentation? And I should be able to rerun your entire code with your data set and arrive at the same tables, figures, uh, or any other output that you arrived, right? So that's what we mean by reproducibility in this context here. There is a wider concept of reproducibility that basically means, you know, if I if you if I go through your material methods of your paper, um, I should be able to reproduce your study uh, on a lab setup or even on a field setup. That is a different type of reproducibility. We're not talking about that here. We're talking about if you give me your code and data, I should be able to reproduce exactly what you reproduce on your side. Oops. Hold on. Okay, so uh, this applies to um, other people reproducing your work. So let's say if you publish a manuscript and you include your data and code on your with your publication, which is becoming uh, more common uh, these days, other people should be able to reproduce your work once you upload that that, that raw data and that script to the your publishing um, um, journal. Also, your future self reproducing your best work. So what this means is, you know, I'm sure that you've, if you've been in grad school for more than a year at least, uh, I'm sure that you will run into the issue of, you know, maybe you do an analysis this month uh, and you think you got it all down and you're ready to start moving with the writing. And then, you know, maybe you're brainstorming a little bit more with your advisor or maybe you get feedback from other people and you have to come back and reproduce parts of that work, but also change parts of it. So really your future self is, you can think of your future self as your collaborator, like, right? Your future self is gonna need to come back to your own material and rerun that and hopefully that will be reproducible. And so why bother with reproducible science? Um, so this tracks how and why of specific decisions and analysis. So both through code, but also some other, some other techniques or tools that we're gonna be seeing like version control are things that we can use to really you know, not simply do something, but also having a documentation of what we're doing and especially the why of specific decisions. So if you ever, you know, did a data analysis for a data that perhaps is not like experimental design data, but more like observational data, 
that where the I guess the opportunities for exploring are wider, uh, you really can think of like how many decisions did you have to make during that entire process that were perhaps even though we try to make them objective, but sometimes are subjective, right? I decided to use this algorithm or I decided to use this hyperparameter value or whatever it is, whatever decision you made, um, you know, those are important when we're trying to reproduce things. And, and, and if we're using the proper tools, we can always keep track of the whys and the hows of, of, of what we're doing. We can also quickly modify analysis and figures. So especially if you're using a programming language like we're doing here, um, you know, if you can come back and if you just want to change a small component of that, it's easy for you to just edit your code and do that as compared to if you're doing in point and click software that perhaps you have to redo the whole figure from scratch that, you know, I've in the past, you know, very long past, I use Sigma plot for my figures. I've used Excel as well for my figures. And I know that um, if you want to do make, if you want to have a figure that's very professional looking and very sharp, it takes a lot of clicks and points. Uh, and so if you're using reproducible science, it's easier for you to do that. And because of that, it also increases your efficiency because if you want to change something, it's a lot faster for you to come back and add it as compared to redoing a whole figure from scratch or even analysis from scratch by point and click software. Also rigor and transparency are very important here, especially if you're first for yourself, right? Because you're writing these in a way that you can always come back and see what you did, why, why you did it. So it's easier for you to see the transparency behind your decisions. And also the rigor part, I think it's, if you start working on a data analysis of your projects that you're getting ready for publication or that at some day you wish that they will be published. And if you have already a mindset that I will publish this script along with my manuscript, that already puts you in a mindset of, I'm gonna make sure I'm being very rigorous here with my own decisions and making sure that I'm very objective. That it's gonna be easier for reviewers to understand the decisions I made here and not just, you know, choose things in your analysis that perhaps could have been chosen differently, but you don't really explain why. So that the rigor component is also important here. And it could potentially give you increased citations because now you're publishing a paper, but also your data and also your, your source code. So those are three different sources of potential citations that you have. Okay, but is it really that important? So I think especially, I don't know, maybe if five, six years ago, there has been a lot of papers around this topic of reproducibility. If you have not heard about this, there has been a real uh, crisis around this where um, one example is this nature survey where they interviewed uh, 1,600 researchers and found that over 70% of them have tried and failed to reproduce another scientist's experiments, meaning that you ask for your colleague to send you their code and data, and 70% of the times they failed to be able to reproduce that. And also that over 50% have failed to reproduce their own experiments, which is really, I think, kind of mind blowing that you think that you, if you think about it is like, if you go back and try to reproduce your own data, your own results, sorry, not reproduce your own data, reproduce your own analysis results, uh, over 50% of them fail. And really the main causes here are selective reporting. Uh, so when, you know, perhaps you choose to only show data that confirms your hypothesis, but don't show the whole picture, uh, very weak stats. Um, you know, I, I know that if you're already reviewing papers for journals, you may have seen this. I've seen this many times that a lot of people that actually get pu papers published have very weak statistical background, meaning that they may run analysis that for them it, it may make sense, but actually is not statistically sound. Um, so that's another another big component here is a lot of times people don't know really very well the stats that they're running. Uh, maybe they get reviewers that also don't know that. And so it gets it gets to the system, it gets published as is. And, you know, I guess a reminder is just because it's published, it doesn't mean it's correct or is good science. Uh, because a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we find uh, papers that have been published that have weak stats behind them. Or maybe code and data unavailability and other causes. So one example that I... I normally talk about is, is this um, example from Duke University. So in 2006, there was this big scandal at Duke University where a group of researchers in a human um, cancer research group 
So they developed this machine learning algorithm that could predict um, the best treatment for each individual cancer patient. So I, as far as I understand, there are different types of cancer treatments and different patients would benefit more from some than other types of treatments. And it's kind of like a trial and error thing where normally the doctor prescribes first one treatment, sees how the patient responds. If it doesn't respond, if they don't respond well, they change to the next one and so on. So this university developed this algorithm that could predict right off the bat what was the best cancer treatment for each individual patient. It was, at least in the medical science, it was a big breakthrough. Uh, this algorithm started being used by universities, by hospitals. It was really being adopted more and more until a different separate research group asked for the data and code from this Duke University group because they wanted to reproduce that, that algorithm. And after a lot of hesitation, they shared the data and code. And this other research group that was trying to reproduce the results had a really hard time reproducing those results. They were only able to reproduce the same results, the, the same outcome um, algorithm after deliberately making a lot of, a lot of um, very important changes to the data and the code, which is not the goal, right? If you have to change your data to make you get the same result as your colleague, that's not rep reproducible science. And so this opened up a huge investigation at the time. Um, the whole the whole lab, it was not just one professor's lab, it was multiple labs, but the whole team was investigated at the time. And they discovered that there were many, many faults that happened all the way through the process, starting from all, all the way from the undergrads who work in the lab through the, you know, the graduate students, the postdocs, and the PIs. Uh, a lot of issues around reproducible science. One of them that they were able to find is you know, they were doing a lot of data wrangling in Excel. Um, and as you all, you all know, Excel doesn't document what you're doing. And so someone went to the database, they switched the values of two columns, but did not change the headings. So that messed up a lot of things. Um, and many, many mistakes like that, that ended up leading to an algorithm that supposedly was doing a really good job when really it wasn't even reproducible. And so in the end, because uh, the second research team failed to produce the, the 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 results of this of this uh, group, um, you know this this turned out into a, a big lawsuit, and uh, the 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 main PI behind the Duke team was fired, and and so on. So there were a lot of issues here, and of course, I guess at least most of us here are not working with human subjects, so our science, you know, is probably not going to have that huge impact on a human's life. But still, we're doing very important science here, and we want to make sure that our science is reproducible. And so I guess this whole talk here is, is around making sure that we have the right tools and knowledge to do that. All right, so I just want to walk you through, you know, kind of my own path on reproducible science, some barriers that, barriers that I found, and also some solutions um, that I found uh, for, for those barriers. Some things start very simple. So the first barrier that I had was file naming and management. And so, you know, this was during my first year of my master's degree. Uh, this is how my file management system looked like. So if you can see, uh, you know, there are Excel files here. Uh, there are JPG files, which are figures I'm producing. Um, there are this JNB, which I think is like a Sigma plot type of file. So Sigma plot is a point and click plotting software that I was using at the time. There's some SAS code and it's all mixed. You know, the names don't really follow any convention and it's kind of messy, right? I'm sure that at some point in your career, you were managing your files like this. Um, and so everything mixed together you know, the file names are not very informative. And this was just my first year of my master's. And, uh, you know, the more your graduate school studies evolve, the more files you have, and the, you know, the, the easier it is to, for things to become messy, right? And, you know, I hope this doesn't look familiar, but if it does look familiar, uh, we're gonna go through some tips here of, of how to fix that. So the first solution here is principal file naming and project management. So three principles of file naming are that they are machine readable. So by that, uh, you know, we want the file names to contain key metadata and to be delimited with either a dash or an underscore. 
So one, uh, one example of a file name that I had was, so I was working with nitrous oxide emissions and corn systems. So I was, you know, one file name that I had was SAS cumulative flux two years dot XLSX. That was my data set. So maybe we can rename that to something that we have an year range starting with the file name separated by an underscore here with a variable that I'm measuring. And then if it is daily or cumulative, you know, that, that looks a lot better. So it's easy to search and filter because you can use the metadata on the file name to search and filter for that. And very easy to extract metadata. So I, I think we're going to see this uh, in, in a future exercise where we're going to be importing multiple files at once in R. And if those files have metadata, we can extract that, that metadata and turn that into columns when we, when we read all of them in uh, automatically. So if your files have metadata, and especially if you're using a consistent delimiter uh, character, like either dash or underscore, that really helps things out when we need to extract this metadata um, in a programming setup. The second principle here is that it is human readable, right? So we want the names to provide content or information on the content, and we can use this load concept, which is basically just using the, the, the dash or underscore. So here are just some, some examples uh, of files that I had. So daily one, right? Maybe at the time I knew what this meant. I do not know what that means today. And I'm sure you also don't know what that means in my context. Analysis here, one analysis of what, right? I'm, I'm collecting so much data that analysis is really, um, could be anything. It could be yield, it could be nitrous oxide emissions, could be soils data and so on. Figure.png, right? Very non-informative and the same way you can see the others here. So how can we make this better to make it easier for us when we're trying to, to read this, right? So instead of daily one, I should say the year, so 2013, the variable, and that is daily emissions instead of cumulative. Or maybe instead of analysis year one, I can give the year, I can say, what is the variable? What is the scale? And that this is an ANOVA. Because you know the same way you could have different types of analysis. It could be a regression. It could be something else. Or maybe instead of having figure.png, you again have ear, you have the variable, you have the scale, and then you're saying that's a plot, and so on. So we're, we can really help ourselves if we use some principles when we're naming files here. And you know I think this question is kind of interesting, is that which set of files do you want at 3 a.m. before a deadline? Right. I mean, you can imagine that having files that are organized and easy for you to read just help a lot to make this process easier, especially if it's 3 a.m. right before a deadline. And also, and the last uh, principle here is that it plays well with default ordering. What do I mean by that? So we want to start the name of the files with something numerical. So it could be a date. It could be a time if that's important for your experiment. It could be experiment number or anything else that makes sense to be in a given order. And if you're using dates, we want to use this format here. So year first and then month and then date, or, sorry, and then date. And this is important because, you know, I'm sure you've been through things where you name like, I don't know, January 5th meeting advisor. And then that does not sort well, right? Because J, January is gonna be under the J, under alphabetical order. And similarly with any other date format besides this one, even if you say, you know, January, you mean 0105, January 5th, um, still not gonna sort well if you have multiple years in this, in this folder. So really this format here is what's the most helpful. And it's a good idea to laugh bad uh, numbers with zero. What do I mean by that? So if you have numbers from one to nine, instead of saying one, you say zero, one, zero, two, zero, three. Uh, because if you don't do that, what happens is when you sort by alphabetical order, you're going to get your one and then your tens and then your two and then your twenties, which again is not what we're after. So if you do zero, one, zero, two, that makes sure they're all in the, in the proper order. So instead of having things like this, where I first begin with the name of the variable and then I give a date where I'm actually starting by the month and not left betting it uh, month and then year. You know, in this other case here, I do start with also, I start with the date, but it's in, in the wrong format if I want to make this um, easy to order. Uh, and on the, the third one as well, instead of all this, we can switch on a way that we start off with the year 
Then we have left pad numbers that are less than 10 um, when representing month and then the date and then the variable and so on. So you can, I hope you can see how this can help you to get your files organized. And this doesn't have to be science related files. It can be really any files in your computer. So we're talking about file naming. So now let's take a step up the ladder and talk about how then we manage these files uh, together. So we really wanna go from this mess of all seeds or files being mixed together and we're not quite sure how many there are, where they are and what they represent to something like this, where we containerize different file types into different folders or containers in this case. Uh, for this is uh, something that, again, is a very simple and, you know, even, I guess, is one of the simplest things we can, we can do, but really pays off a lot, is by just having our files uh, separated into the subfolder structure of having at least a code, a data, and an output subfolders. I always have these three subfolders in my projects. Um, sometimes I have more. So if you're working on a manuscript to write off of the results of this analysis, it may have one that is writing, or maybe you have one, I don't know. Sometimes like if, I, if I'm pulling data from the, not data, but if I'm pulling like manuals and guidelines or things like, or even papers that I want to have attached to this project, I have like a resource uh, subfolder. So you can have more, but the minimum I would suggest is having code data and output. Um, we're really, you know, as you would imagine, any coding uh, type of file, like an R script, an R markdown, or a Quarto, which we're going to be seeing today, R markdown, so you're going to get familiar with that, and Quarto we're going to see um, the next next class. Um, it should go under the code folder. Any data that you have should go under data folder, and any output, meaning any figures or tables that you produce, should go under output folder. And also, if you're using R in RStudio, like we will be in this class, um, in RStudio, we have this option of using an RStudio project, which I am using on this uh, directory here. So you see this dot rproj, is a, it means that it is an RStudio project. We're gonna see more what this is and what it does, but it basically helps you to focus your RStudio window view on this specific project. And if I do want it, so let's say, I don't know, I probably have, I don't know, maybe 10 different analysis slash projects I have going on right now. So if I want to quickly switch from one to the other, RStudio projects allows you to do that in a very seamless way. So we don't get on the same RStudio window scripts from different projects that are creating objects that are not related across different projects that can become a big mess. So if you have containerize each project within each one, uh, with within each RStudio environment using RStudio projects, that's a big help. All right, so barrier number two uh, was proprietary point and click software. So during my master's, I started using a lot of point and click proprietary software. So, you know, Excel for data organization manipulation, SAS for my statistics, Sigma plot for plots, and ArcGIS for maps. So all these are, well, SAS is not point and click, but, um, you know, it is a, I'm not sure if it is a language, but it allows you to do some coding for it. But besides SAS, all the others are point and click software. And just by using proprietary software is already a, could be a barrier for reproducibility because now imagine that, you know, if you use SAS for your stats and now I want to have your code and your data, I have to have a SAS license to be able to run what you did. So every time you're using proprietary software, you are, you know, even even though you may not be even aware of it or thinking of it, but you are imposing a barrier of reproducibility if whoever wants to reproduce your work does not have access to that proprietary software. And also point and click software is very hard to document, right? So imagine, you know, maybe you're still doing this um, and if you're not great, but you know, we've all either been there or, or are still there, where you're using, let's say, Excel to do a lot of data manipulation, right? It is very much prone to human error. So imagine that you're doing something in Excel, creating a column, you're choosing this and that and combining things differently, filtering and so on. You're doing all these steps without having a good way to document what you're doing. And even though you may think that, oh, I, I mean, you know, sometimes it something is so hard 
when we're doing it that we think there's no way in my life that I will forget how I did this because it took me so much effort and energy, but you will. You will forget about this next month and for sure next year. And so it is very difficult to document what we're doing when we're using point and click software. And you know, this is just, I guess, an exercise for you to think about it. Like the last time that you organized it in Excel, you know, do you remember each step that you took when filtering or deleting cells or creating new columns? Or what was their decision making process? Probably not. Like I to, to this day, you know, after a lot of learning on data wrangling um, skills, I only use Excel for data entry and that's all. I don't do anything else in Excel because because of this, because it is really difficult to document what, we're, what you're doing um, in case you have to come back and either understand or, or redo the same steps. It, it was to the point where like, I really, like I have been using Excel just for data entry for many years now. And there was one time that I was in a meeting with someone that, I mean, didn't, didn't know R, did not care about it. And they just wanted to see a scatter plot in Excel. And I, I was like, I tried and I could not make a scatter plot in Excel. I was like, I'm so sorry, you know, this is so silly, but I have not done this in Excel for such a long time that I couldn't even reproduce this kind of plot in Excel. But I told him, but if you, you know, let me open R here and I can do that very quickly here for you. <laughs> but I guess, you know, that's, that's, um, I think that's one, it's definitely one, one thing that I would recommend is that you um, avoid doing a lot of things in Excel besides data entry. So you keep yourself sane and reproducible. You know, or even like, you know, in this case, if you ever use Sigma plot or other point and click software for plotting, imagine last time you had to make a complicated figure. You know, how easy would it be for you to replicate it for a different data set? Or maybe if you've been wanting to change something about that, if you had to. So a solution for that is using free programming languages, right? So, uh, or, or not just programming language, but free open source software. So instead of using Excel, you know, we can use file types like CSV, comma separated values, which is an open source free type of extension. Because um, I think, you know, we all, if you've been in the in the academic um, world, we kind of take for granted all, all the, the access that we have to the licenses of all these software, including Excel. Um, but, you know, I'm sure that you know, I guess most of us here are probably coming from another country and potential developing country and how, you know, maybe access to even Excel may not be um, as, as, as simple and easy as it is here in the US. Instead of using SAS, you know, R, Python, uh, or maybe Julia or other languages, uh, instead of using Sigma Plot, R or Python, instead of using ArcGIS, R, Python, or if you really want to use a point and click software for, for GIS work, QGIS is a great option for that. Uh, it is free open source. It is still point and click, so it's not great on, on, the, on the documentation and reproducibility aspect, but at least it is open source and we are not imposing that paywall um, on whoever wants to reproduce your work. And code is documentation, right? So I'm just printing you here a very quick, easy, simple data frame that has five rows, two columns. I have plot number in one of the one of the columns and then nitrous oxide in PPM in another column, right? So let's say I'm going through this, this is my data uh, and I wanna do some filtering, some steps uh, with this. So um, you're not familiar, if you're not familiar yet with the concept of the pipe, which the pipe is the symbol here, this is something that's widely used in R, especially if you're using tidyverse packages like we will in this course. Uh, the pipe basically takes whatever it is on its left side and passes as the first argument of whatever it is on its right side. So here I'm starting with, with this data frame here. This is DF that has five rows. I'm passing this on to a function called filter in R. And let's say I want to only keep reasonable values of nitrous oxide concentrations. And for me, reasonable is more than one. So I decide to filter that, only the value is greater than one. And then I want to transform this from PPM to PPB. So I use, I use a pipe here to pass this result onto the function mutate, which creates a new column in my data frame. I create this column called N2O PPB, which here is the formula for doing that given in PPM. And then finally, I just want to keep the, the columns plot and the new column I created into OPPB. And so I use this function select to only select those columns. And this is the outcome of that. 
So we see that we went from this data frame here to this um, in a very reproducible documented way, right? First off, your code is your own documentation. As you see, we're using functions here that are explicitly saying what we're doing. Um, and we can really understand the language of these functions to see what they're doing. But also I'm, I'm furthering my documentation by including comments, right? So I'm adding the hashtag symbol here to really add comments to further explain maybe why or how I'm doing something here. So, you know, if if I ask you, well, how, how did you end up with this data set here of three rows and these two columns? You know, if I just send you my code, you can see exactly what I did. What, what, why did I do the steps that I did uh, and so on. So this is documentation in, in itself. It just, you know, I guess I'm just saying here that the code documented, but if you want to further extend that documentation, you can add comments uh, to explain the whys of what you're doing and making more understandable. All right, so third barrier here was static programming and environment. What do I mean by that? So we started using our scripts. So the intro to R was only using our script, which, you know, this is not our script itself, but you can kind of see that we have here, whenever I want to write a comment, I use the hashtag to kind of say that R should not try to interpret this line of code. Then I have my code lines and so on. And it's all together, right? So this is the script. If I produce a table, it appears on my console. If I produce a figure, it appears on the plot window to the right. So one improvement to that, as we saw already, is to use a integrated development environment like RStudio. So we, we bring in the, the scripting, uh, the console, the environment, and the plots uh, all in the same window. So that's already helping us there. And then finally, we also, we're gonna see today is we're gonna use literate programming uh, with RStudio, with an ID. So what literate programming is, it basically mixes code, output, and narrative all in the same file. If you have not used things like iMarkdown, Quarto, Jupyter Labs, um, we're gonna be seeing today, but that's what that is. It basically helps you to create a narrative that you can write your, your narrative, um, you know, have your code and have your outputs right below that code, all in the same file. So some examples, again, Jupyter, R Markdown, and Quarto. We're gonna be seeing some of that today. Um, barrier number four is keeping track of changes. So, you know, a lot of times I, I wish in my analysis that I could go back in time. I don't know if you ever felt this way, but you know, you can think of it that you spend the whole week working on this analysis only to find out that it didn't work as expected, or maybe you got stuck with multiple bugs and you wish you could just go back to however this project was a week ago. Or maybe at some point in your script, you had an important piece of code that at that time you thought, you know what, this is not doing what I want. I really don't need this. And you simply deleted it and kept going. And then to maybe, you know, a couple months from, from that point, you realize that you actually needed that piece of code and you just wish you had it. You can go back to it. So wouldn't it be nice, useful, and sometimes perhaps graduate school life saving if you could simply go back in time and start fresh from your latest working version? So a solution for that is using version control, right? So version control, you can think about it as track changes, but really on any file type. It is most useful with scripting files like R, R Markdown, or Quarto files. And as your, as your code is growing and developing, uh, you can think of version control as taking snapshots um, over time uh, of different versions of both your code data and really any file that you're keeping track of. So let's say if you start a project, you know, you take a snapshot in, in version control language, we call that a commit. So you make a commit of your um, of your files at this point in time, and then you keep developing. So you work tomorrow, you develop this new data wrangling step on your analysis, you take another snapshot, and then you do your ANOVA, you take another step, snapshot, and so on. So each step that you're developing in this code, you're taking a moment, taking a snapshot that's called a commit, um, and then keep moving forward. So this really connects your current self with your past self, you know? So let's say I'm here today, I finalize all my data analysis for this project, but I don't quite remember why I did this step here. 
you can always go back in the history of these files and uh, understand whenever that step happened and really connecting what you're doing now with what you have already done, decisions you made in the past. So when we use version control locally, and by locally, I mean in your own computer, your own machine, we use Git. So Git is not the only software that does version control, but it's probably the most popular one. Uh, if you have not heard of it, uh, we're gonna be using Git in our own machine to keep track of our projects locally. However, that takes us into the next barrier here, which is that re reproducibility requires sharing. So, you know, Git's gonna work locally and is very powerful on its own, but it only works on your files on your machine. And it becomes really powerful when we can have these features of taking snapshots of your files over time and working with those online. And also when you do that, it becomes a very a very great place for collaboration and sharing, especially on, on programming um, types of projects like what we're gonna be doing here. So a solution for that is open data and code uh, where you know, we introduced GitHub for that purpose. So GitHub is an online centralized platform that combines Git, what we get from Git locally with collaborative tools and cloud storage, even though we don't think of Git as cloud storage, but it can think about it in that way as well, all free. And, you know, a lot of times one hesitation that I have, and um, I know all of you may be thinking about this is, well, okay, so what if I have my project I'm keeping track of it with version control on my computer, and I connect this to a GitHub repository like we have for this class, um, but that's open to the public. I don't want my data and code to be open yet because maybe I'm still working on it. I still haven't published it, or maybe you're working with sensitive data. It cannot be public. GitHub gives you the opportunity to create repositories that can be either public so everyone can see it, or private, where only you and perhaps people you invite to that project can see it. So that's that's a very nice feature. So I just want to show you here, uh, do a quick GitHub demo. Uh, you know, because we so if you have not used GitHub yet uh, on your own, we started using a little bit uh, for the class when you were downloading the material, but we're not really using that as GitHub to the full extent. I was just using so you could get the files I needed that. I needed you to have for the exercises. So really, um, you know, I'm gonna show you a repo that uh, is one of my GitHub repositories. It is actually still a, a private uh, repository, even though I couldn't make it public because we already published that work. But um, it was a repository that I used to conduct the entire analytic workflow of a manuscript among two collaborators. So myself and another colleague of mine, where I was doing a lot of the spatial uh, analysis and statistical analysis, and she was doing a lot of the crop modeling analysis side of the project. So same manuscript, but two people working on different aspects of it, uh, working together on a GitHub uh, repository. So both of us had our local versions in our computers. So I had, all, I had on, on my computer, I had a copy of the GitHub repo. On hers, she had a copy of the GitHub repo as well. So let's say whenever I did some changes on my computer, I then, I guess, you know, we can say uploaded but it would be like you do a push, you push your changes up to GitHub. So I do something on my computer, I commit locally. So take I take a snapshot of that on my computer and I send it to GitHub. And on her side, for her to be able to see what I did on her computer, she just on her side has to do a Git pull, which pulls from GitHub any new information. So that way, whenever she works, she pushed to GitHub and I pulled to my computer. Whenever I worked, I pushed to GitHub, she pulled to hers in a way that GitHub serves as this main hub where everything connects. And then both of us can have a copy of that on our sites locally as well, um, if we're pushing and pulling that like that. So I'm just uh, gonna launch this here just to show you. So if you, you know, so this is, is, the, is the GitHub repository for that project, it's called Bang Polder. Who are working with data from folders in, in Bangladesh. Um, so we have data, markdown, which serves as the code folder, output, resources, and so on. You know, I have a README here that shows a little bit of uh, information about that. And all these files here are files that I have in my computer, she has in hers. 
And one thing that is cool that I was telling you about like time travel, I guess, in your files is remember that I told you that whenever you take a snapshot of your files, that's called a commit. So we can come back on the commit history of this repo here. And each time one of us took a snapshot of our data of our project, that comes here as a commit. So we see here, uh, so this is her, um, my, my collaborator working here. This is her as well, this is me. So we see how like different times, you know, I was, I was making some updates or she was doing some updates, but we all had a history of that combined here. And let's say if for some reason I wanted to go back to the first stage of this of this project, like when we first created it, how did this these files and this repo look like? So I can come here on my first commit. I went to the latest, the 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 oldest commit, and you can browse your repository at that point. This is how it looked like. It had no folders, it had no files, but really I can go back to any point in time and see how my repository and my files and my not just the file names, but what's in them look like at that point. So this is, you know, when we when when we when I mentioned about going back in time and understanding how your files look like at a given snapshot, uh, this is what we can do with with uh, with the commit history in our Git uh, work. All right, let's come back to the presentation. Okay, so the last barrier here is what if software versions change, right? So things change. Your computer operating system gets updated, your R gets updated, your R Studio gets updated, different packages you're using get updated. Um, and sometimes even if you're working off of the same GitHub repository, our local software versions may be different, right? So maybe I have one version of ggplot2 that is older than the version that my collaborator has. And maybe something that they're using on their side is not available in the version that I have installed on mine. So that can also cause discrepancies and issues that could impact reproducibility. So one solution for this is containerization. What do I mean by that? So containerizing projects um, helps to avoid these discrepancies of software versions. Um, and the way it works is you create, you can imagine uh, an actual container around that project. So around all the files that contain that project and that container is keeping track of the versions of different pieces of software that are being used inside that project. And whenever you share that project with someone else, it kind of ships already with these versions in place. So even though there may be a newer version of ggplot2 or dplyr or tidy models, whatever it is, if I started using this project with a given version, it will ship with that version, even if newer versions come become available. Um, and this really ensures that the project is reproducible not only with your collaborators, but also with your future self. And you know, if you've been using programming languages enough, I'm sure you ran into the issue of you have this beautiful code that you know it works, there is no bugs in it. And then, you know, next month comes a, a new package update or maybe a library update. And then you try to run that again and it's not working anymore. It's the code is broken. So now I have to, go, have to go back, have to see what was updated in the package and then fix whatever it needs to be fixed for you to keep working. So one example of container software is Docker. So Docker is, um, um, is also a free, so I think it has some, a paid version, but but you can use it as a free software uh, where it basically creates containers for different projects. Docker really is perhaps the most comprehensive one because it's gonna work across all these versions we talked about. So including your R, our studio packages, and even your um, operating system versions. There are other pieces of um, other different types of software that also do this in a finer scale. So in R, there is this package called RENV that keeps track only of your R package versions. Um, and Docker would be something that takes care of all those different versions. So really in a nutshell here, uh, reproducible science is about using sensible file names, organizing your files in sensible subfolders, using free programming language software whenever possible, 
using literary programming tools, uh, using version control locally, and also distributed version control, which would be GitHub, uh, to collaborate and share data and code, um, using containers to make sure all of your versions match. And these, you know, these are some of the things I came across, and it's not a comprehensive list of reproducible science tools, but other things that can make your science reproducible would be, for example, custom functions. So if there is something that you do a lot and you're always like, I guess, writing the code for the entirety of that, uh, you can actually create a custom function to help you with that task. So you don't have to be repeating the, all that code every time. Doing iteration uh, is one aspect as well. Every time you have a task that you have to repeat multiple times, you know, maybe the first, if you, you know, whenever we're just learning about these concepts, the easiest way is to just copy and paste that code. Let's say you're doing an analysis 10 times for different data sets. You basically just copy and paste that code 10 times, just change the data set coming in, easy fix, right? But it's also very much prone to error as well, even though you're programming, but there's still room for error because now you have to keep in your head track of what you're changing from one data to the next and so on. So by doing iteration, um, using iteration tools like you know loops, um, and and we're gonna see a very special way of doing that in R using the per package really helps you to make to make your science reproducible. Um, code peer review is something very interesting. I may include some of that in this class uh, later on, where basically you produce a code and then you share that with a colleague and they go through it, see what you're doing, see if it makes sense, if you're using what would be the most appropriate like algorithm, arguments, whatever it is, and other, other things, right? There's many other things that can come here in reprodu reproducible science. And just, uh, you know, I, I leave this here, even though for, for you guys may not be the most appropriate or the most useful, but some personal marketing here is that this entire presentation here was made with Quarto, which is a file type we're going to be learning maybe Thursday or maybe Tuesday. Uh, and the source code for this entire presentation is on my GitHub. So this is a link. You can click on that and see how this presentation was put together with code. Um, as you're already all familiar, I have a, a, um, a website for my lab where I have a lot of other resources as well. And by the way, the website was also made with, Quart with Quarto. Um, you can also find stats programming teaching material, including video and code on my website. So on the same page that we have the teaching material, I have a whole bunch of workshops I've given. I think for 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 you all here, um, you know, I will cover most of those during our different classes. So I guess for you going through my my um, workshops I've given in the past is going to overlap to some extent with what you're going to learn in this class. Um, and also, you know. I, I make this this personal marketing that all these concepts and many more we're going to go through in this class that you are in this semester. So I guess thanks for being here and having this interest in all these topics. Um, and I hope that you get get a lot from it. Okay, so this is what I had for the lecture part of this this class. I just want to open up for a brief moment here, if anyone has any questions or thoughts, or maybe you want to share an experience where you suffer with, uh, I guess, lack of reproducible science tooling, uh, then you think it can be useful to learn some of these. Any thoughts or questions? What do you use the Docker software? So I've used Docker um, maybe a few times. I guess I use more RMV which is uh, that keeps track of our packages uh, versions. Uh, yeah, but but I mean, ideally, you know, you would use some type of containerizing software for every project just to keep you keep your sanity, I guess, uh, as things get get updated. Have you have do you have any experience with any no, of those? I was thinking it might be similar to like virtual environments from Python, like okay. to isolate the versions. Just... Mutual environments is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. Is that like a software? Yeah, or usually you keep like versions of Python per se or specific. Uh, okay, so environments in Python, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's, I mean, if I understand well, because in Python, you, you basically set, you can set up separate environments with different packages that you're using, right? 
yeah, in our that concept doesn't necessarily exist in as as it as exists in Python. Um, because you basically have all of your packages available after you install, but then you, of course, if you want to use something, you need to load that using the library function. So in that aspect, um, yeah, I don't think in R there is an equivalent of environments in Python. Yeah, so it might be similar to the container concept. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Awesome. Any other thoughts or maybe questions? Hey, Dr. Bastos. Yes. Just curious here. So your your website, like, does it run through GitHub? Because I see it says leoambastos.github.io. So how does that work? Just, I mean, just curious. Yeah. So, um, so the way that my website, that I update my website is basically I have this RStudio project in my computer where I have mul multiple Quarto files that set up the design, the layout of the website. Whenever I change one of them, I do a git commit, which is again, like taking a picture of what you're doing. And then I, when I send that commit to GitHub by doing a git push, it goes to GitHub, GitHub runs it. And if there are no errors in running it, it already deploys automatically uh, to GitHub pages. Yeah. So there's a few extra steps there that, you know, there, there's something called GitHub Actions. That is, that's when you set up this, the, the auto deployment of the website um, that, that has to be set up for, for it to be connected between you sending a push to GitHub and then that running the website, building it and deploying automatically. But that's basically how I it, how it do it. Yeah, any other questions? Yes. Uh, so not reproducible. <laughs> huh. Is this the, the area you get or huh. yeah, I'm not sure. Let's see. Mm, yeah, let me, I'll, I'll look into that, but I can, um, yeah, I can, I can share with you all the, the link of that. Maybe this link broke and I didn't update it. Yeah, but thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Any other thoughts or comments? All right, I don't hear anything, so let's go ahead and get into the coding part of today. So as you, um, as you just saw, there is some of the some of the tips and perhaps um, you know advice. Hmm. Um, that we have is basically st starts with file naming and folder structure, right? So let's go ahead and do that. I want to invite you to go to the main folder of the class on your computer, wherever you have that. I'm going to navigate on my side. Uh, so you should be seeing something similar to this, where in my case, I have, you know, my folder has the name of the course. And then I have here the 01 intro, which is what we did on the intro part. And then I have a 2024 DSA, which is the GitHub uh, repo folder that, that you all downloaded already. I want to invite you to come here and uh, create a new folder. So on this level here, right on the main folder of the course, you create a new folder. Let's call that 02 Wrangling. You can see how 02... Um, you know, I'm using I'm left I'm left padding numbers with zero here, so they they fall into the proper uh, ordering. Then once you create the folder zero to wrangling, you go inside of it, and here let's just create those those subfolders of um, any any project that we will have from this point on. So the first one I'm going to call data. The second one I'm going to call code. Please go ahead and also do this on your site. And the last one I'm going to call output. All right. So um, 
the next step we're going to do here is to create an RStudio project. Before we do that, I just want to show you why, what that is, and I guess what are the main benefits of that. I'm going to just launch an RStudio window here. That the one that pops up is actually the one for the website. I want to change that quickly just because it has a, a file structure that is not the most common for what we're going to do. So let me show you one for one of my, one of the projects that I have. So, okay, let me, let me just um, mention the following. If you launch your RStudio, most likely you will see that here on the top right, it's going to say, I think it says preview none or project none, something like that. That means that whatever our studio window you have open right now is not within any given project, right? You see that on my side, it says Bastos Lab because this is the name of the project that I have for my website. And one of the cool things that I like about projects is that you can very quickly change from one project to the next um, and changing really the focus of the entire our studio window. Before I do that, I just wanna show you here. Once you start working with our studio projects, you're gonna use more of the files tab down here. If I come on files and I wanna to go to the main, the main folder of this project, I click on this R blue button. You're gonna be using this a lot as you start working with projects. You may not have this R blue button yet uh, because you don't have a project yet, but I just wanna show you that by clicking on that, it takes my view to the main uh, folder of this, uh, the main directory of this project. So as you can see here, there's many files associated with this specific project, which again is the one that I use to create my, my website. There are many, many uh, folders here. Now let's say, you know, I built my, I, I just built my site. I added some links there for you to see. And now I wanna go back to my analysis. So I can come here to click on the, on that project name and see a list of the most recently projects I worked with. Just want to launch one of them for you to see what happens. So I'm going to launch US Cotton Weather. If I just click on that, it's going to basically completely switch the view of my R Studio to that project, where it basically opened up any scripts that I had already opened up from my last time I visited this project. If I come here, click on my R blue button, you can see that the view of the files of this project have completely changed to be focused on the files of this specific project where I have, again, code, data, figures, meeting notes, output. There's some files that are in the wrong place here. As you can see, this plot should be inside of output or figures. But anyways, you see that all the files here are related to this project only. Um, you know, if I come on code, I see all the scripts of this project. I can open any one of them and just keep going at any point that I stopped. And let's say this, I was working on this for a paper. Now I need to go back to a class assignment that I have that I'm also doing in our studio. I just come here and click, you know, maybe let's do this one. Just click on another project. It completely switches again, my view to the view of this project. So these are different sets of files, different completely working directories and so on. So using our studio projects allows you to do this very quickly. And if you have not used something like this, you know, you may be familiar how if you're just opening R scripts or scripts of any sort within the same window, it can become confusing of what you're doing. Is this script here from my my class or from my my paper or whatever it is? So projects helps us to keep organized and focus on a given project. And if we have to change, it does that very, very easily. In the past, if you have been using R for a while, what also used to happen is if you open any scripting file outside of a project, what would happen is that your files, whenever you came to files, this would be the root of your computer. That would be the directory. And so a lot of people would start their, their scripts by using this function called set, set WD, that stands for set working directory. And then they would give here a path like all the way from the root until the path of the folder they're in and set that as their directory. This is very much so discouraged in R. Instead, we should be using projects because that really focus your view on relative paths. You may hear more about this, but relative paths is basically if I share with you this 
project here, the folder of this project, whenever it comes to your computer, you're gonna be able to seamlessly import things and export things because we're using relative paths. If we're using, I guess, absolute paths is the name, where where I instead of starting at the folder I am now, I actually started the root of my computer. If I send you a script that does that, it will not work on yours seamlessly. You're gonna have to update that that path because it starts at the at your root. So the root's gonna be, I mean, the path from your root to your current directory is gonna depend on on each person. So absolute paths are things that we try to avoid. Relative paths are things that we try to use, and our studio projects does that um, for us already. So this is basically what our the benefits of using our studio projects, and I just want to go ahead and. Let me see, I just want to close that. Let me see if our studio gives me project none. No, let me just close this project then. Okay, so this is probably what you're seeing on your side at this point, right? Project none. Let's go ahead and create a project uh, for our zero to wrangling exercise. So by that, you click on project none. You're going to click on new project. Because we have already created the main folder for that project, that is the name of the main folder is zero to wrangling. We're going to click on this option, existing directory. And then we're going to browse to that folder. So I want you to click on browse and then just find on your computer, wherever that is, um, We're gonna, the place we wanna be is, let me, so right now I'm at the main folder of the of the course, right? And you should be seeing something like this where I have zero one intro, zero two wrangling, 2024 PPA main, and then I have another another folder here. So what what the, the level we wanna go into is the zero two wrangling. And if you remember, we have already created code, data, and output folders, right? So that's where um, you should go to and create, click on open and create this project at this level here already. Uh, you don't wanna go inside code, data, or output. You wanna be seeing code, data, and output, and that's the level you wanna create the project. I actually... Okay, so click open and then create projects. And that is basically going to relaunch your RStudio environment, where now if you check here, you should be seeing the zero two wrangling as the name of this project on the top right. And you also, if you go on the files tab, you should also be seeing the subfolders that we have already created for this project, which right now they're all empty, right? If you go in them, they're empty. Um, and you can always, you know, uh, now that you have a project created, you know, I just want to make sure you remember that anytime that you go inside of a folder, if you want to go back to the main folder of that project, click on that R blue button, it takes you there. Okay, so now we have our files, our, our folder set up or our studio project set up. Now the next step is going to be to get a copy of our GitHub repo. So, Today, I guess, is gonna be the last time that you're gonna be manually downloading that. Um, next time that we have to do it, we're gonna before have a Git and GitHub intro and set up our GitHub, our Gits locally in our connection to GitHub. And then we're gonna be able to simply, uh, I guess, download directly through Git and GitHub instead of doing a manual download. But more about that in the future classes. For right now, I still want you to go to the class um, to the class GitHub repo. So the link is again in our website, if you don't remember it, but it would be github.com forward slash Leo and Bastos forward slash 2024 underscore DSA. <coughs> so if you go there, you're gonna see that, um, you know, just on the repo itself, I have one data set that I, brought into the data, the 03 data folder. So the soybean XLSX. And I also have um, a code 
on the class code 04 class code that's for uh, data wrangling partial dot rmd so i want you again to come to the repo of the course manually download this repo by clicking on code download zip you can unzip this folder and copy and move this folder inside of the main folder of the course Right. So if you go ahead, download it, uh, unzip it, and then just move it into the main folder of the course. You know, it's okay if you overwrite the one you already have, as we talked about this 2024. I'm oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong course here. This 2024 DSA, um, you should not keep your own files there. You just use this to retrieve data and code that I share with you. So if you just move it in here, it should be fine. It should not be losing any files if you follow my advice of not keeping your files in there. And now what I want you to do is if you downloaded the latest version that, that is on GitHub right now, if you go inside of whatever you download from GitHub and you go inside of 04 class code, you should be seeing the 0116 data wrangling partial dot RMD. If you're not seeing this, maybe you are not looking at the latest version from GitHub. If you are seeing this, great. That's where you should, you should be. So I want you to come here and copy this script. I'm just gonna do a control C, command C. Copy this script from the class code and then go back once, go back twice. Now you should be back at the main folder of the course and you should be seeing the 02 wrangling. So I want you to go in there, go inside of the code folder and paste this script that you just copied. Okay, I'm gonna show this one more time. So I'm going back to my main folder of the course. I'm seeing the, what I got from GitHub. I go inside there. I go inside 04 class code. And I should be seeing this script 0116 data wrangling partial dot RMD. I copy that, go back one level, go back one more level. Now I'm back at the main uh, folder of the course. I should be seeing 02 wrangling. I go inside of that. I go inside of code and I paste this script there because this is the one that you're going to be editing, not the one directly from the GitHub repo folder. Okay, anyone needs help, moments, have a question? Please make sure that you speak up as we're gonna need to have this to be able to follow the exercise. All right, I don't hear anything, so I'm gonna keep moving. As you probably imagine, we're going to have to do the same thing now for the data. So I'm going to come back, come back. Now I am at the main folder of the class. I'm going to go back into the 2024 DSA main on your side. I'm going to go inside the 03 data folder and copy the soybeans.xlsx file. I'm going to go back one level, one more level. Now I'm back at the main folder of the course. I'm going to go inside 02 Wrangling, and I'm going to go inside the data folder and then paste the soybeans.xlsx in there. So for you to be ready and set up for us to start the coding exercise, you should have done the following. So from the beginning, you should have created the 02 Wrangling folder to be found in the main folder of the course. If you go inside 02 Wrangling, you should have created the code, data, and output subfolders, and also created the R project uh, from our, directly from our studio as we showed. 
you should have downloaded the GitHub repo that I updated last night and copy the code inside from the GitHub repo folders inside the code folder in your computer and copy the data from the data folder in the GitHub repo to the data folder of this project. Okay. Anyone still need some time to get to this point or maybe if you're not able to get to this point, speak up so I can help you. All right, I don't hear anything. So I'm gonna assume everyone was able to get to this point here. So even though I have here on my, you can see now on your site as well, um, now my RStudio icon, at least on the Mac, I'm, I'm not sure how that looks like on Windows. It already tells me the name of that project right there on the icon. So that's also helpful. Um, <clears throat> now, if I come here, you know, and I go to the files tab, if you're not on the main view of the files, you click on the R blue button to get there. If you go on the data folder, your soybeans.xlsx are there. If you go back to your main folder and go inside of your code subfolder, your code is there. I wanna ask you to click on the code here so it launches on the site. And I wanna make a very, very important note here that I guess I forgot to mention this in previous times I taught this and I only realized this became an issue afterwards. So what some students do, when they're working you know, home or even in class. So let's say I'm gonna close this project. You don't have to close, keep, keep yours open, but I'm gonna close this project. And so I have this project none. Now you can see I'm not inside of a given project. And I wanna keep working on this script that we are gonna to develop today. What a lot of people do is they come on their folders, they go inside of code and they double click on that script. So that script opens nicely but it's not within your project. And then people start having issues because then your relative paths are not working properly, or maybe you have, again, come back to the same issue of on, on the same RStudio window, you may have scripts from multiple different projects that are unrelated and we don't want that. So I guess a word of caution here is every time you know you're gonna work in a given RStudio project or work in a project that you create an RStudio project for, what I want you to do is not double click on your scripts. I want you to actually double click on your R proj icon to launch that project. When you do that, notice how now I don't have that project none. I actually have the project name on top. And if I go on files, I see the file structure correct. And then here, from here, you, you come on the files, you go on code, and then launch your script from within our studio to make sure you're launching the right script for the right project. A lot of times I've seen this issue happen where students double click on the script, which launches on a, a known project related R Studio window, and then they have issues with that. So to avoid that, always remember, if your project is not launched, launch it by using the R Studio project icon in your folder. In your case, that, that may, may even be here within your recently used projects that you can also use this shortcut instead of double-clicking the actual file. Okay, so a very quick, um, I guess, intro to R Markdown. So R Markdown is a file type that's, that starts with .rmd that what it does for us is basically allows us to mix narrative code and output on the same file. If you have used Jupyter Notebooks, this is kind of like that, although I prefer R Markdown over Jupyter Notebooks. Um, but so what happens here is on my script, anywhere outside of here, I can write here as I would in a Word file. So this is, I mean, you don't have to write it. I'm just writing to show you. This is script used to analyze and rank or to wrangle data for class. You know, you can write here normally. R is not going to try to interpret this. You cannot write comments like this normally in an R script. You would have to add a comment in front of it. So that wouldn't be um, 
considered you know part of the code or part of something to be interpreted. Now in our markdown, markdown, so mark, let me give you a little bit of history, I guess. Markdown itself is a language that is basically used a lot um, to, I guess, to, to do what we're doing here, even though Markdown is not necessarily directly related to R itself. So in Markdown, we can write things like this. Um, you know, as you may have noticed, when I use one hashtag in this region of the code, this actually serves as a heading one. And we can see that if you don't have your outline showing, you can click on that outline button. It's gonna show you the outline of this code. And uh, every time I use one hashtag that adds a heading one level. So let's say if I wanna do something like this. As you can imagine, if I'm using two hashtags, that means a heading two. So let's say I wanted to do a 2.1, example 2.1. See how, I mean, here you see the syntax, but also see how that's updating on your table of contents or your outline on the right side. It is indented appropriately. And then, you know, the more hashtags you add, the more heading levels you start going down. That was just uh, just to give you an idea of what a hashtag means um, in this part of the code here. I'm just going to delete all that because I just wanted to show you. Where the code actually is interpreted like it was in our script is inside of a chunk. So this here is a chunk. We can see that a chunk starts with three apostrophes, curly brackets, and the language that's being used inside of the chunk, and then close brackets, and then the end of the three apostrophes and the chunk. What happens here is that our markdown and Quarto, which we're going to see next class, can be both used to run R and Python on the same script. So that's why we see this R as being the first thing that comes right there because it's telling telling the interpreter what language it should it should use or what interpreter should use to for this specific language here. In our case, it's going to be R. So outside of the chunk, you can write as normally. I would say if you are taking notes for yourself, feel free to take notes in this region here. You know, you don't have to take notes anywhere else. It could be straight off on your scripts. If you, for some reason, want to write something inside of the chunk that is not to be interpreted, you need to use the, the the hashtag, the pound sign to do that, just like you would if you were in an R script. Right? Outside of the of the chunk, it's fair game to write as you as you would normally. Inside of the chunk, think of it as an R script. Uh, that you need to use the hashtag to add comments. And then what you're gonna see, um, you know what? Let me just you don't have to do this on your side. I want to just show you. Um you know, I shared this R markdown file with you already, so you didn't create it on your site. If you were to create on your site, you would go under File, um, New File, and then there's a whole bunch of them. So there's R script, the one that we used in the intro. There's a Quarto document, Quarto presentation, R notebook, R markdown. So let's say I wanted a new R markdown. I'm just not gonna even, well, it's gonna call it test. So this is the R markdown. Uh, the default that it gives us uh, is just, you know, it has a chunk here where it's setting some options. It has some text. It has some links. And something I want you to, to notice is on this example that always gives you when you launch a new R markdown, I normally just come here and delete. I just leave that part of the code, uh, but I delete everything else. And then I start fresh with whatever I want to code. But let's say when I was telling you that, um, you know, R Markdown is a literate, literate programming file type because it incorporates narrative. As you can see here, this is narrative, your code, which is seen in this chunk. And also if that code, if that chunk produces an output, that output appears right below that chunk, right? So this, if you use, uh, you know, use Jupyter Notebooks, that's is the same concept. Um, and if that output is an actual plot, it appears, the plot appears right below it. It does not appear on the plots window here, at least not by default. So as you can see, um, you know, this is very easy to tell a story because now you can write something about it, write the code for it, and then show the result right below it. And to tell the truth, a lot of people write 
whole paper is straight out of R Markdown. I have not done that myself, but R Markdown has, and Quarto as well, have extensions that you can even uh, control your citations within it. So it's it's really is is a really is a is a one way that people use to actually write and publish papers is to have R Markdown files. I want to go ahead and knit this file just so you see one of the other things I think is very useful about um, our markdown files is if you learn just a few tricks that are very simple and easy to do, you're gonna be able to write write off from your the script that you worked on, you can actually knit it, which basically just compiles it and produces an output that you can choose that it could be HTML, PDF, or Word. The default is HTML. So I just want to show you here. This is the default output of, of that R markdown that we just saw. So all the text that's there is here. The, the data is here. The output of that, that chunk is right here, and so on. I've written many reports using markdown, R markdown or Quarto. They're really useful for that. If you start using that more, you know, it helps you with, uh, um, I guess, with having everything together in the same file already, instead of having, you know, doing all of your figures in R Studio and R, exporting to file and then writing a report in Word. You know, it has pros and cons, um, but it's just something I wanted to make you aware of. For today, this is going to be, well, before we wrap up our, our introduction to R Markdown, I just want to point out, every R Markdown and Quarto file are going to begin with something like this, where it has three dashes, some metadata about this file, and it ends in three dashes. This part, if you delete it, that basically messes up your R Markdown. You should not delete this whole. If you want to delete like the date or maybe change the title, you can do some, you know, I mean, report example, whatever it is, you can do some of that, but th this part of the code here should never be completely deleted because that's what sets up the metadata that makes this in our markdown and that helps it to be knitted into a report that, that we just saw. And this part of the code here is called YAML. This is spelled like this. It is an acronym. I don't quite remember what it means, but you know, if you ever hear in data science someone saying the YAML of the file, this is what it means. It is not specific to R or R Studio. This is something that I think YAML is is its it is its own language to some extent um, that is used to provide metadata on scripting files. You don't have to know much more about it except that it's called YAML. So if I ever tell you, you know, add your date on your YAML, that's what I mean. That this is the part of the code that you would come and add something here. But we're not going to do that a lot. Yes. Does that, for the YAML, just curious, does it have any like, um, like does that if you change that, is it just there for to represent the file, or does it have any actual uh, meaning like of what you enter? For example, like if you if you when it says output the HTML underscore doc, if you change that, would that do anything or change the time, like, or is it just kind of show you as a preview for the file? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, Austin. No, this is, um, so especially right here, I could delete the title as well. I don't think that would have an impact, but if I delete the output, I think that would have some issues, especially when you knit, right? So if I knit this file, you know, if I, I removed the, the title, so you can see now on the knitted version, it doesn't have a title, um, but the, the, the HTML still gets rendered, it still gets knitted, um, if I delete the output, I think it will not like that, but we can try. And that's the cool thing about programming, right? You can try, oh, it did work. <laughs> so yeah, I guess it still worked. Um, yeah, maybe, I guess if we delete the, the dashes altogether, I think that's where it would throw an error. Let's see, maybe not, <laughs> but I guess, I guess it will. No, it did not throw an error. So that's, yeah, that's a great question actually. And I, um, so I never, I, I know sometimes when I accidentally removed the YAML altogether, I had some issues rendering. Maybe it was because I was rendering more complex R Markdown files. So I would, I would say, you know, to not completely delete it because you may run into issues, but um, 
Yeah, I guess in this case specifically, which was very curious, it didn't have an impact if we deleted it. But I know I've had issues in the past where I, I had issues if I didn't have it there. So, you know, it's normally going to be self-created when you create a new R Markdown file. As you can see on our own, I have just a title. Um, so, you know, I guess it's always good to have there. So if you need to change metadata, you will be able to do that here. But yeah, I guess that's that, that was that was a, a good exercise. I guess something, you know, you may already be doing this or if you're not, I would recommend that if you have questions, you know, um, of course, we already talked about ways to ask for for help. But in this case here, it's a very easy way that you can even try it on your site, right? You can just delete it, try to run it. If it works, it works. If it didn't work, then you learn and you just undo what you what you had done and keep going from there. So that's one of the beauties of programming. It's it's hard to break it as long as you have a copy you can go back to. All right, any other questions or thoughts? I don't hear any, so I'm just, in my case, I'm just gonna close this um, this R markdown that I created here just to show you, um, as that was not the main the main goal here. It was just to give you a quick intro to R markdown. I will be sharing with you a cheat, I will be sharing with you a lot of cheat sheets actually. So R Studio is really good at creating cheat sheets for their products. I will, I will share with you one for R markdown and you're gonna be able to see some more easy ways that you can do to customize your R markdowns um, so yeah, we'll, we'll leave it for a little bit later. All right. So let's, let's get started with actual coding of today. So we don't have a lot of time, but we can at least get started. You know, if you're new to programming, especially in R, um, I guess this may be a convention in other programming languages as well. I normally have my my first part of the code. So in this case, that part is a chunk. The first chunk I leave to load the packages I'll need. Um, and I do that because it's very easy to see what, what I'm using uh, for this exercise uh, and what, what you know, if, if, if I run a function that doesn't run, then I can come back here and see, well, did I load that package or not? And if I didn't, I just add a line here. Um, so here today we're going to be using read Excel, which is a package that we use to read Excel files. Uh, Genitor is a very useful package to clean to clean data names mostly. You're going to see what I mean in a second. Dplyr and tidyr are the work, um, the powerhouse of data wrangling in R, and we're going to use read R to export a CSV file. So what what, what we could do here, and I just want to make you familiar with this. Again, if, if you don't recall, if you have your cursor anywhere in the first line and you hit command return or control enter, it will run that piece of code, that line of code and go to the next line. And then if you do again, command return, it will run that and go to the next line and so on, right? One thing you can do if you are sure that you wanna run the whole, all the functions within this chunk is you can come here and hit the play button. That's gonna run all of them simultaneously. I see sometimes like people have, especially if you have chunks that give you errors, meaning there is an error in the code of the chunk and you're trying to fix or troubleshoot, I would not recommend you you play, you hit the play button and run the whole chunk because that's not gonna be easy for you to troubleshoot the error. If you have an error, have a cursor in that line and then just to come and return and go line by line is better. All right, so I'm assuming, uh, so if you ran this and you did not get any errors right below it, I'm assuming you were successful in installing all these packages. If you did have an error saying package X is not installed or was not found or whatever, um, you may need to revisit that. Remember that if you need to install a package, use the function install.packages within quotation marks, give it the package name. All right, so assuming that we were all able to uh, to load these packages for this current session, let's go ahead and read the data, right? So that's normally one of the first steps we do is after we set up our packages, we then uh, reading the data that we're gonna be using today. So I wanna save that data as an object called soyk. Uh, we're gonna use the get symbol, so the assignment symbol. 
we're going to use the function read underscore Excel. So I'm using every, so there's a lot of functions that are read underscore something. Those are normally we use to import something, right? So we're going to import a data set. There's also a whole bunch of functions that are write underscore something. That means that we're going to write to file or export something to file uh, using a write function. So in this case, read Excel, open and close quotation marks. So once you have your quotation marks, both the opening and the closing one, have your cursor right in between them like I do here and hit tab. So what tab does is maybe on your side, they already populated with the name of this file. On my side, because I created that example R, R markdown and I have more files in the code folder, it gave me an option to select. So right now, I know that my path, what it is seeing is that I am inside of the code folder. Because the data is on the data folder, we have to basically get outside of the code folder and then go inside the data. To get outside of a folder in, in really any setup, uh, we use dot dot forward slash. So if you say dot dot forward slash, that takes a step back on your on your folder hierarchy. And now you should be seeing something similar to mine where you see the R proj, the code data output and other things here. So now you can select the data folder. And if you hit tab again, it will already uh, complete that with the soybeans.xlsx because that's the only Excel file or the only file we have inside of the data folder. If we had multiple files, it would give you a list and you could choose from that list. All right, so if we do that, we run this, you should have been successful in loading this file. Uh, you should see the soy k object on your environment. And if you come here on this next, um, you just run soy k. If you recall, that's basically going to print that data frame right below for you to see. Okay. Was everyone able or was someone not able to load the, the data set? Please speak up because we're going to depend on this to keep going. All right. I don't hear anything. Oh yeah, go ahead. It didn't show on the right side. So, um, so the console right now, what I would say is you can just minimize the console. The console was important when we were using our scripts because that's where things would be printed. But now because we're using our markdown and it prints right below the chunk, we can just minimize the console. But did it work for you? Okay, awesome. Anyone else uh, needs help? All right, I'm not hearing anything, so I'll keep moving. So if you just, uh, you know, just run the name of the objects gonna print below here. This is a tibble. We talked a little bit about tibbles. Notice how the way that it prints is it tells you the number of rows, 16, the number of columns, eight. It shows you the first columns that fit inside of this view. If you click on this button to the right, it shows you the remaining columns. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second here. And if, if it has more row, more than 10 rows, it will show you 10 rows, but it gives you the option of browsing through more of them if you click on the two below it. So notice this again is a tibble. So a tibble gives you these printing options of making it more concise so it doesn't overwhelm your, uh, your view. And then I wanna show you a function here that, you know, I know that when I was, I guess making the switch from Excel to only using programming languages to look at my data and wrangle it, I would miss to see it more similarly to what we see in, in Excel. So you can use this function here, view, and you can say soy k. If you run this, it should open on a second tab here, more like a, a little bit more like an Excel looking table, right?
Okay, so um, I guess I'm gonna quickly walk you through what this data here is. So we have the plot column is basically just the plot that where the data was collected from. Uh, we have a treatment number that, so we have five treatments. So we have, you know, going one through five. The crop stage that it was sampled was R4. This is a study on soybeans. Um, this was the, pota the fer potassium fertilizer rate in pounds per acre that was applied going from zero to 150 pounds uh, per acre. And then um, it was the, the soybean trifoliate potassium concentration at the R4 stage was measured uh, in four locations. So that is Tifton, Midville, Watkinsville, and Macon. So these are the columns we have. Um, and I just want to leave it there for now. I want to close the soy K because again, this is just for viewing. We're not editing anything directly on it. So I'm going to close that, come back to the script. And I guess just uh, just explain a little bit more again. So this, the study was conducted at four different locations in one year to assess the effect of potassium fertilizer rates on soybean trifoliate potassium concentration at the growth stage R4. Each study was a randomized complete block design with potassium rate as the only treatment factor with level 0, 50, 100, and 150 pounds of K2O per acre. So that's the data that we just saw. I wanna show you another function that I use normally to just um, have an overall view of the data. It's called glimpse. So if you come here on the next chunk, you can type glimpse and then call the object soy K. So if you run that, what you're gonna see here is that glimpse gives you number of rows, number of columns. It gives you each one of the actual columns it tells you what how R is interpreting these columns, right? So DBL stands for double. That means a numerical variable, as we would expect, you know. So I mean, plot is numerical, treatment is numerical, stage is character, right? Because this is an actual word, or it has it has a letter in it, and then everything else is numerical here is double. And it gives you just like the first the first entries of each one of those columns, so you can kind of have a feeling of what you know what they are. And then, as you already, if you go to the next chunk here, uh, the next function that I always recommend you use when you're inspecting data that you read into R is summary. So if you do summary soy k, we're going to see a summary again um, of this data. If you <coughs> excuse me, if you recall. Um, for every column that R interpreted as numerical or double is going to give you a statistical summary of that column with minimum, first quantile, median, mean, third quantile, maximum. All right, so, you know, I guess the ones that would be interesting to see here is, you know, I would first look to see, okay, are my potassium rates at least within the levels that I know that I had between zero and 150? Yes. If there was one that was 160, you would know, well, maybe I, I had a typo, I mistyped something in one of the cells and that's why I'm getting this. So you would go back and fix that. Uh, on your concentration, uh, leaf potassium concentration, you can also you know have some idea. And because we have different columns for different locations, you can kind of see a little bit how that changes. So Macon being the lowest uh, across all four and so on. And again, th these are our concentrations and this is in percentage. You know, if you had a number that was greater than a hundred, I mean, even if you had a number greater than, I don't know, three or four or 5%, you know, if you would know biologically, that's not something that you see often, plants having more than 5% potassium in their, in their leaves, at least not soybeans. Um, but especially if you see a very high number here, you it would be a red flag for you that maybe there was data entry typo, maybe there was an analytical error that came from the lab with the wrong number, and so on. So those are things that we also want to keep keep an eye out for. Okay, so um, the first the first function I want to want to show you here is clean names. This function comes from the generator package, and 
I guess before I show you what it does, I just want to point out, I want to print soy K first, which we have already done, but I just want to show you here, which is something very common that we, we have our column names not following a single, um, I guess, pattern of how they're named. So if you see plot has the P uppercase, treatment has everything uppercase, stage is all lowercase, and then we have K rate potassium breaker. So we have white spaces here. We have parentheses. So all of these special characters just create noise and make it more difficult for us when we're using this data, wrangling, plotting, modeling. So the goal here is to have column names that are consistent, that follow a single style, and also that are short and informative, right? And I, so I don't want to have like white spaces. I don't want to have special characters. And now imagine that here we have eight columns. Maybe it would not be a huge deal for you to change each one of them individually. But what if you have a hundred columns, right? And now that becomes a lot, lot harder work to do. So if you come here on soy k underscore one, we're going to give it uh, the assignment symbol. And we're going to use the function clean underscore names. And the first argument here is the data that we're going to use. So that's soy k, right? So if we clean names of soy k, save that, that result to soy k1, and now print soy k1, look at what happened. So clean names basically standardized all of our call names to be lowercase, which I actually recommend, uh, regardless if you're using clean names or not. If you, you know, a lot of times, and I still sometimes do this because I forget, I guess, but if you keep all of your column names lowercase, that actually helps you a little bit of time because if you have, let's say, your first letter uppercase, you're going to be doing caps lock on and off. By having everything lowercase, that just helps you with not having to turn caps lock on and off when you're referring to that column and makes it faster to code, even if it's just fraction faster. And then notice how what it did here. So we had potassium rate. Uh, it was like potassium space rate space parentheses pounds breaker. It removed the parentheses. It added uh, this low concept here. So adding underscores when they had white spaces, and it kept that same, um, I guess, pattern across all the columns. So this is a. It is usually a first step I always do, especially if it's a data frame coming from someone else that, and especially if that someone else is not paying attention to, to these things and have column names named, you know, all across the board. This helps you to quickly get something standardized, clean, concise, that is easier to manipulate. All right. Okay. So, <clears throat> the next step here is I want to apply a filter. So before I do that, I just want to use this function called names on the object soy k1. Remember, soy k1 had the clean names applied to it. So if I do names, this is going to basically print to me all the column names inside of soy k1. This sometimes is useful um, if you're trying to refer to a given column for a given task and you don't quite remember how the column is named and if your data frame has a hundred columns it's going to be maybe harder for you to print the data frame and go to that column itself to see how it's named but the names function helps you to do that very very fast so here what i want to do is use the soy k1 object and filter only the columns where potassium rate is equal to zero and then I want to save that to an object called soy k2. So to do that, let's just add the assignment symbol here right next to soy k2. We're going to use this function called filter. The first thing that we give filter is the data coming in. So that data coming in will be soy k1. Remember that it wants it to be you want it to be soy k1, not just soy k. We add a comma. Let's just hit return or enter to break the code. And now we give the condition, right? So the condition is that I want my potassium rate in pounds per acre to be equals to zero. So I just want the rows where potassium rate was zero or where I had the control without fertilizer applied. If you run this, 
and you print it. Notice how now we kept all the columns, but only the rows where potassium rate was equal to zero. Right, so we gave it a condition for filtering only given data rows. The filter function, I'm, I'm showing you here uh, data wrangling functions that I use maybe all the time whenever I'm doing data wrangling, which is always because every project requires at least some data wrangling. Some projects, so I, 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 my, my wife works with, she's also a professor and she works in food microbiology and she has um, like data on the genomics of bacteria for antimicrobial resistance, which has nothing to do with this class, but I just want to show you or give you an example of how much data wrangling is important. So uh, she had this data set that has like, I don't know, hundreds of columns, thousands of rows, and she had to do a lot of wrangling to get what she needed to get. And she was doing all by hand in Excel. And I was just like by her side, just like, you know, we can do that a lot faster and more safe than by Excel, right? And she, so, you know, I got into this project with her. I collaborated with on that project, on that paper. And pretty much the whole data analysis was data wrangling. It was like, there was really no, I guess, analysis of variance or regression or machine learning. It was basically data wrangling from beginning to end um, that like she was going to do all that in Excel. It would be hell. She would get a headache every time she just looked at that Excel file and we were able to create a script, basically with data wrangling, we produced that analysis, we published the script, the script with the with the paper. Um, and just, you know, I just want to give you that example of like data wrangling, even though we're going through some very simple functions, but all these combined, and the more you do it, the more you practice it, the more you create this skill, is gonna for sure be very helpful for you and even in future collaborations that you may have. All right. Let's go to our uh, next chunk here. So let's say that um, I want to transform, I want to create a column. So right now, you know, our treatment was potassium rate in pounds per acre. Let's say I'm getting this ready to publish in a journal or maybe a international conference that needs to be, that needs to have the international uh, units instead of pounds per acre, the English units. So let's create, let's transform that potassium rate from pounds per acre to kilograms per hectare. So to do that, um, give it the assignment symbol. We're gonna use the function mutate. So every time you're creating a new column in a data frame in R, I want you to think of the function mutate. That's the function that will create you a new column based on something. So the first uh, value that we give it is again, the data frame. I want us to use soy k underscore one. So not the soy k2, soy k2 we filter just to have the, the checks. I want to actually apply this to the whole data set, which is at soy k underscore one. Give it a comma. <laughs> um, I wanna go ahead and uh, we just get the names again here. So names of soy k underscore one just so we see below. Um, so we see here that right now it's called k raid LBAC for pounds per acre. Let's create a column called k underscore rate underscore kgha. So k rate kilograms per hectare. Let's give it one equal sign. And now what we do is we give it the formula. So the formula would be if you want to copy here, potassium rate pounds per acre, or even if you want to type it, that's fine as well. So to get to kilograms per hectare, we just take the value in pounds per acre and we multiply by 0 0.454 and divide that by 0 0.405. I'm just going to give you a second here to, to type the number. So Potassium rate kilograms per hectare is equal to potassium rate pounds per acre times 0 0.454 divided by 0 0.405. One thing to notice here is right here, I just use one equal sign. I just want to call your attention to this difference here. On the filter, we use two equal signs. The reason for that is that on the filter function, we're using a Boolean operator. So equal, different, more than, less than, contains, doesn't contain. 
those are all Boolean operators and the equality of Boolean operator is two equal signs. Here, this is not a Boolean operator. I'm not trying to see if potassium rate kilograms per hectare is equal to this. I'm actually creating this column. So that's why it's just one equal sign in case you were wondering. All right, if you run this and we print it, you know, if you just go to the right here, you're gonna see now this potassium rate kilograms per hectare. So we did the transformation for us and it worked. But I just dislike the fact that it gives us so many um, decimal points here uh, for the transformation. So what I want to do next on this chunk is I just want to round this number here to have no decimal points. Because really, this is the treatment. You know, we would be uh, assuming an integer, I guess, and not, not something that's broken down. So um, there are a few different ways we can do that. I want to show you one where inside of the same mutate function, if you just add a comma and you hit return, we can create more columns here. And it doesn't have to be the same column name as the first one. In our case, it will be because I will I want to overwrite. So if I just copy k rate underscore kilograms per hectare, I give one equal sign. There's a function called round. So round, open and close parentheses, you give here the potassium rate kilograms per hectare column name. And inside of round, you wanna say how many digits you want to round to. I want to round this to zero di digits. So if you run this, now your potassium rate is gonna be in, it's gonna be rounded, right? So just a few pointers here that could be potential places for error, make sure you have your commas, right? So there's a comma after circuit so one, there's a comma after uh, the 0 0.405. Also round is a new function in itself. And because that function, we're opening parentheses and closing that parentheses for that function, but also don't forget to add a parentheses that closes the mutate. So there's gonna be one here, one here. They can be on the same on the same row. That's not going to affect anything. You just have to have both of them. And if you have them in separate rows, at least I guess it helps with the readability of the code. All right. I think that. Um, for today, we can probably stop here and continue and finish this exercise next class. Um, I do want to encourage you to, to read the reading material for this class because uh, we're going to have a quiz next class about it. So please go ahead and read it. It's about tidy data. It's a concept that I guess it was materialized through uh, Hadley Wickham's paper on it. Um, and I just want you to be aware of that because we're going to be basically using data wrangling for creating tidy data sets that are easier to work with. So go through that reading material um, for next class, and then we'll continue from this point on. Don't forget that you want to save what you worked on today. Click on the Save button uh, to save that. You do not want to save your environment, so you don't have to worry about saving that. Um, and once you save your script, you can just close this R window here. That would work uh, as well. And before you all go, let me just create a GitHub issue for attendance for today. All right, make sure you respond to the attendance issue to claim your attendance. It has to be within the class period, um, you know, because the issue remains open. So if you answer after class, I may not consider your attendance. And if once you're done with that, uh, you're good to go. I'll see you. I'll see you next Thursday. And you know what? I'm sorry, everyone. I just noticed that our class today only went to 1110. And of course, uh, stay to eleven thirty. Sorry if you, sorry about that. I'll make sure I'll I'll get my my mindset properly in the dates. Thanks.